that Lord Denny and Justice Krishna Iyer have both said that compassion is extraordinarily important in law amongst lawyers and particularly amongst judges. One must be able to assess whether a person has something genuine to say in a case. With this note, I, on behalf of the Karnataka State Bar Council Law Academy, extend my humble greetings to our distinguished dignitary, Honorable Justice Kumar, retired judge of High Court of Karnataka. Welcome, sir. I would also like to welcome Sri Anil Kumar JM, Chairman of the Karnataka State Bar Council, Sri Gautam Chan S. President of the Karnataka State Bar Council Law Academy. And I'm extremely delighted to welcome all the members of the Karnataka State Bar Council and trustees of KSBC Law Academy, along with delegates, advocates, budding law students, and all other participants who have gathered here and continuously supporting us. Friends, feel free to post your questions in the chat box and it will be taken up during the question and answer session. Without any further delay, I would like to welcome back our prestigious and honored dignitary, Honorable Justice N. Kumar, who will be continuing with the topic Orders 17 and 18 of the Civil Procedure Code 1908, that is examination of witnesses and marking of documents in today's session. Welcome, sir, and the platform is yours. Thank you. Good evening to all of you. Yesterday, I was talking about world evidence oral evidence to be adduced at the time of examination of witnesses. Now, when you examine a witness, you don't confine it to only oral evidence. In civil cases, documents plays a very important role. And therefore, evidence includes both oral evidence and documentary evidence. When that is so, with reference to documentary evidence, the Evidence Act, Indian Evidence Act, exhaustively deals with that. Section 64 of the Evidence Act deals with proof of documents by primary evidence. That means, if you are talking about proof of a documentary evidence, how do you prove it? Section 64 says, documents must be proved by primary evidence, except in the cases here and after mentioned. That is, if you rely on a document, and that document itself is produced, that is the primary evidence. In other words, the original of the document is to be produced if you want to prove the document on which you rely on. That's why they say documents will be proved by primary evidence, except in cases in and often mentioned. What are those cases? Those are the cases where primary evidence is not capable of being produced. If the original is lost. Then is it not possible to prove by any other means. Therefore, section 65 says, cases in which secondary evidence relating to documents will be given. So therefore, primary evidence and secondary evidence. When you talk about documentary evidence, lawyers should be very clear in their mind about what is primary evidence and what is secondary evidence. And the law says a document has to be proved by producing the documentary evidence, primary evidence. If primary evidence is not available, the law also permits the proof of the documents by production of secondary evidence. So when we talk about secondary evidence, section 65 says, secondary evidence may be given of the existence, condition, or contents of a document in the following cases. What are those cases? A. When the original is shown or appears to be in the possession or power of the person against whom the document is sought to be proved or of any person out of, out of reach of or not subject to the process of the court or of any person legally bound to produce it and when after the notice mentioned in section 66, 
such person does not produce it. Yesterday I was pointing out to you order 12 rule 8. You are ready with the documents. You need some more documents which are in the position of the defendant. Before you need secondary evidence, you must call upon him to produce the original. If he produces the original evidence, that is the primary evidence. In the event he refuses to produce the primary evidence, and if you have got a copy of the same, you can produce the secondary evidence and he can't have any complaint. It is in his possession. It is his document. I call upon him to produce. He refuses to produce. Then a case for production of secondary evidence is made out. B. When the existence, condition or contents of the original have been proved to be admitted in writing by the person against whom it is proved or by representative in interest. That is, in the pleadings, you set out the particulars of so many documents. The defendant in return statement admits them. They are not in dispute. Documents which are not in dispute. Therefore, the question of proving the document will not arise. But still, you want to rely on the contents of the document. In which event, the law says it is not necessary to produce the original because the document is not in dispute. So therefore, where the documents are admitted in writing by the opposite party, you can produce a copy of the said document and it is not necessary to produce the primary evidence, that is the original document. Thirdly, when the original has been destroyed or lost or when the party offering evidence of its contents cannot for any other reason, not arising from his own default or neglect, produce it in a reasonable time. These are cases where there was primary evidence. You have taken copies of it. And one fine day, the original is lost. Original is destroyed. Original is burnt. If you are able to tell the court and satisfy the court that the original is not in existence because of these things, then a case for production of secondary evidence is made out. A copy of which could be produced. And the uh, fourth time is, when the original is of such a nature as not to be easily movable, if it is physically impossible to bring that document and produce it, then a copy of it, normally in such circumstances, nobody produces the entire document, a page, a few pages, a chapter could be produced. And also, when the original document is a public document, within the meaning of Section 74. Section 74 of the Evidence Act speaks about public documents. These public documents are in the public domain. These public documents cannot be disputed. It may be a gadget notification, it may be a survey sketch, it may be uh, a, a textbooks, it may be books published by the government. There are so many public documents that are set out in Section 74. If it is a public document, it is not necessary to produce the primary, that is the original. You can produce a copy of it and that is the sufficient for the trial. Similarly, we have what is called as the original is a document of which a certified copy is permitted by this act or by any other law in force in India to be given in evidence to be given in evidence. You know, many documents are registered in the sub register office. Many documents are registered in the district registry. Many documents are registered in the register of societies. These are all public documents. Trust deeds, save deeds, society registration, uh, articles of association, memorandum of association. These are all registered documents. Copies are available. Certified copies are available, given by a competent authority. In which case, it is not necessary to produce the primary evidence. You can produce a certified copy issued by a competent authority with their seal and signature, and that is admissible in evidence. Similarly, about account, account books. Now, these are the documents when the primary evidence is not capable of being produced, you could produce the secondary evidence and go on with your case. Here, there's a lot of controversy. You have judgments also on this point. Law is very clear that you must produce the primary evidence, document and document itself, nothing else. 
Now, if you are not capable of producing the primary evidence, a law provides for production of secondary evidence. They have set out the circumstances. Now, how do you produce the documents? I find some lawyers filing applications, requesting the court to receive the secondary evidence. Once an application is filed, an objection is filed. Arguments, court has to pass an order. The Evidence Act do not say how you should produce it. These are all over a period of time, uh, which has the rule of uh, force of law, a practice which has developed. The practice is when the law says the original document is destroyed, original document is not capable of producing, when the original document is in the opposite party and that he has not produced it, even though we requested him, you have to lay a foundation. The person who wants to produce the secondary evidence first has to lay a foundation for production of secondary evidence. What is that foundation? The foundation is the witness has to enter the witness box. On both, he should say, one, the original is lost, original is burned, original is not in my possession. It is in the possession of some person, I can't get it. It is in the possession of the opposite party. I have issued a notice, called upon him to produce. He has refused to produce it. Once that foundation is laid, court will admit second. Sometimes it so happens, without laying the foundation, document is admitted. Then the argument is, this is secondary evidence, foundation is not laid, it is inadmissible. Therefore, let me be very clear, in the civil procedure code, there is no provision which requires the party to file an application and seek the leave of the court to produce primary evidence, secondary evidence. There is no scope for filing an application, objection by the opposite party, and an order by the part, a court either allowing or refusing it. The practice is the party who wants to produce enter the witness box on both make a statement satisfying the requirement of section 65 and then the court will permit it to be produced. The apprehension that once it is produced, marked, it is proof of the document is wholly misconceived. This objection is for production. Document is produced. That doesn't mean the court is bound to act on the document. Suddenly court will look into it. But if the document requires proof, it has to be done. Even if a judge were to inadvertently or by mistake permit a secondary evidence to come on record, though the conditions stipulated therein are not satisfied, the judge can always say, I will not act on this document. It is not an estoppel against the judge. In the end of the day, a court is to be convinced about that particular document. So therefore, much of the court time is spent, I would say, wasted in a fight on the question of how a secondary evidence is to be produced, in what circumstances to be produced, and these applications, objections, arguments, orders. So if you look into the case law on that point, it is very clear. No application need be filed. No order need be passed by the court. Party has to enter the witness box, give reasons why he is not able to produce the document then the court will permit him to produce the document. It is not that court should pass a judicial order. If the court receives it, that itself is an order receiving the secondary evidence. So we have spoken about oral evidence and document evidence. This is what we have to gather from the Evidence Act. Now, when the CPC was amended, substantially altering and amending Order 18, when they said examination in chief by way of an affidavit in all cases. That's the word word is in all cases. Sometimes it so happens when you are amending a law which is there for quite some time, you may not be aware of the consequences or the effect of that amendment acting on affecting the other provisions of law. This is one such case. When order 18 Rule 4 was amended. 
providing for the exam in chief by way of evidence uh, affidavit they said in all cases as a word as i said working because that it requires some consideration in all cases There's a lot of controversy and time is consumed in this matter in trial courts. <clears throat> in every case, I'm sorry, not not on all. In every case, the examination in chief. of a witness shall be on affidavit and a copy thereof shall be supplied to the opposite party by the party who calls in for evidence keep this in mind and now read order 18 rule 5 what it says is in cases in which an appeal is allowed this provision comes after rule 4 in cases in which an appeal is allowed the evidence of each witness shall be taken down in the language of the court this is the original provision without seeing this provision this provision was amended the amended provision says in every case exam in chief of a witness shall be by way of affidavit the next provision says in cases in which an appeal is allowed the evidence of each witness shall be taken down in the language of the court so there is a direct conflict between these two provisions it does not stop there taken down in the language of the court one in writing by or in the presence and under the personal direction and superintendence of the judge probably the present generation of lawyers and judges do not know earlier the judges should take down the evidence in their own handwriting subsequently we got typewriters now we have got the computers so therefore the 1908 code said taken down in the language of the court in writing means judge was taking down then there was an improvement from the dictation of the judge directly on a typewriter or the typist came the judge just stopped writing it in a handwriting they started dictating to the typewriter as they do it now to the computerist so therefore this was the mode the civil procedure code provides for recording of evidence but unfortunately the amended provision says exam in chief shall be by an affidavit therefore the supreme court as i said in those cases selam advocates association case has tried to harmonize they did not want to say this section is bad that section is good what they said was keep the intention of the legislature and try to harmonize both these sections therefore today when the witness enters the witness box he gives the affidavit to the court i'm sure people have observed it he will be asked whether it is his affidavit has he signed it has he sworn to it as the contents are true because immediately after this amendment the witness has said it is not by affidavit at all then what will you do and if they have been told to deny the signature they said it is not my signature at all and that time after it was prepared it was filed by the lawyer today and the evidence was taken up on the next hearing day the client did not know what has happened in the previous hearing day he said it is not my document 
So therefore, to harmonize, now the procedure which is adopted is when the witness enters the witness box and speaks that it is my affidavit, it is duly sworn to by me, it bears my signature, the contents are true, that is recorded. Therefore, the court is taking down the evidence of the witness in the language of the court and dictating to the typewriter. So it satisfies order 18 rule 5. And then the rest, it satisfies order 8 rule 3. That is how we have been managing it. So you must know the reason why this happens. The reason why was, there is another provision in the civil procedure code, order 18 rule 13. This is appealable cases. How evidence is to be recorded in unappealable cases is provided therein. There they say, in cases in which an appeal is not allowed, it shall not be necessary to take down or dictate or record the evidence of witnesses at length. But the judge and the examination of each witness proceeds shall make in writing or dictate directly on a typewriter or cause to be mechanically recorded a memorandum of the substance of what the witness deposes. And such memorandum shall be signed by the judge or otherwise authenticated and shall form part of the record. So civil procedure court provides how evidence is to be recorded in appealable cases and in cases where no appeal lies. So how does it work in practice? For example, in Bangalore, you have city civil courts. In city civil courts, the cases decided are all long cut foods, original suits. At the same time, you have civil judges courts of senior division who are designated as small causes courts. They are constituted under the Small Causes Court Act. Civil judge is notified as a small cause judge. It is called small cause. There, the procedure to be followed is summary in nature. Similarly, you have Rent Court Acts, Rent Act Courts. They are also civil judge senior division. And the trial is summary in nature. So therefore, the way evidence should be recorded in the Bangalore City Civil Court, which are all appealable cases, because against a revision, against an order of the Small Class Court, against an order of the Rent Court, no appeal lies. Only revision lies. That is the test. If an appeal lies, word by word, judge has to record. He has no option. If there is no appeal, the judge could take the substance, four answers, he could summarize it, put it in writing, and dictate it. But unfortunately, today, even in small cause court, even in red court acts, the evidence is recorded in the way it is recorded in a original suit. It is because of ignorance. Ignorance on both parts of the lawyer and the judges. The very object of a case being tried as a small cause court in a summary way, it is defeated if you have to conduct the same procedure as a trial. Anyhow, this is what the CPC says. And without touching these two provisions, they introduced this provision, which ran counter to these provisions. And therefore, by the intervention of the Supreme Court, when we are harmoniously interpreting these provisions, five few sentences in the beginning, if the judge records either in his handwriting or dictates to the typewriter or to the computer, and then receives the evidence that is the affidavit, then that is the examination in chief. That is the examination chief of a witness. Now, sometimes when I said question and answers are to be recorded as deposed to by the witness. You see in courts, there are some witnesses who are very smart. There are some witnesses whom we call them as court birds. There are some witnesses who believe that they know more than the judge and the lawyer. And there are some lawyers also who exceed the limits and try to harass the witness in the witness box, humiliate them, 
threaten them. In the result, what happens was, when you put a question, a smart witness knows why you have to He will not answer at all. Question is one thing, he will be saying something else. And you will say, you say yes or no. Law doesn't say, you can't compel a person to say yes or no. You have put a question, he has to answer. Sometimes judge also will phone on him and say, you say yes or no. Yes or no is not. That's not the way to record evidence. Assuming a witness is deliberately playing mischief, law provides for other ways. What is that? Rule 10 says, or the 8 rule 10 says, 18 rule 10 says, any particular question and answer may be taken down. It says the court may, of its own motion, or on the application of any party or his pleader, take down any particular question and answer. Or any objection to any question, if there appears to be any special reason for so doing. See, this is a civilized way of being things in a under civil procedure court. You cannot go on fighting in the court of law. The moment a witness is refusing to answer, the judge can be told. Therefore, law says that is, a, that is the advantage of a trial lawyer. A trial judge, he will observe the demeanor of the witness. The law says, make a note of the demeanor. A witness may be very arrogant. A witness may be very cunning. A witness may not have respect for the court. A witness may not have respect for the lawyer. Fine. You can't change him. In one hour or two hours, you can't change him and they will not dance to your juice. Not necessary. But the consequences will follow. If a witness is deliberately refusing to answer a question, all that the lawyer is expected to do is to request the court to note down my question. Please note down his answer. Question is something, he is answering something irrelevant. Then we can request the court to make a note of the demeanor. That's all. Leave the witness. It is open to the judge at the time of appreciate evidence to say, here is a bloody witness who is smart, who is not speaking the truth, who is playing in the court, he is playing a hide and seek game. This is the question which is put. He is intelligent, he understands. Deliberately, he refuses to answer that question because if you were to answer that question, speak the truth, it may not be in his favor or in favor of the person or on whose behalf he has to give evidence. Therefore, he is avoiding the question. He is trying to play with the court and this is what he has given. Therefore, in these circumstances, the court has the power to record a finding that and draw adverse inference and say, this is proved, simple. Why do you fight it in court? By fighting it, compelling the witness to say yes or no, humiliating him. It doesn't take us anywhere. So therefore, in courts, if a witness tries to be smart, the lawyer should be smart and the judge should be smart. You're not going exposing yourself, fighting with him because he has nothing to stay. He will say something and get away. And if every witness goes on attacking the lawyer and the judge in court, nothing will happen to the witness. In the system, it suffers. And the law has provided for it. Human nature as it is, these provisions are there from 1908. There's a way of dealing with such people. So therefore, when you are not getting an answer which you want, when a witness is avoiding to answer a question, when a witness is giving some stupid answer which is nothing to do with your question, instead of catching hold of his collar, compelling him to say this or that, you can make a request to the court, please note my question. Please note his answer. Then we proceed. And then you can argue, he has been too smart and he should be shown his place. This is one aspect. The other aspect, which is more important for a trial lawyers to know is, People think, all right, let the evidence be over. Yes, we adjourn. I will go and cross examine on some other day. <coughs> or some seniors who have got too many briefs, they will ask their juniors to be present when the evidence is keep going on. Before this amendment, before this amendment, the job of a junior was to sit in the court hall. When the judge is dictating it to the typist or the computer, he has to make a, he has to take down the answer. As the judge would have taken down in writing, 
the junior has to take down the answers given in exam in chief in his handwriting. And if his senior is not there in the court in the evening, he has to go to the senior and tell him this is the evidence. It is on that basis the senior would prepare himself for cross-examination without waiting for a certified copy of the copy made available to them. Now that examine chief is by way of an application. Affidavit is served to you before it is filed into court. So you have the examine chief ready made. Now when the examine chief ready made, you only have to cross examine. What is that affidavit contains? The affidavit is a substitute for oral evidence. Affidavit is not a substitute for documentary evidence. Documents are produced into court. Now, if you want to rely on those documents, that document is to be tendered in evidence. After it is tendered in evidence, the court must admit the document in evidence and mark it by giving an exhibit number. And we are marking of a document is not proof. Subsequently, the party has to prove the said document. All this has not been sent to the civil procedure court. This is something which you have to learn by sitting by the side of what? Your senior. Now, senior and junior, doesn't stay, they, they, they don't sit together at all. That's the change when we have come. Anyhow, that apart, what I am trying to tell the future lawyers and the lawyers who have already entered the profession is this. Oral evidence, you can say anything you want. If you don't prove it, it has no value. But if you are introducing documents, marking documents in the course of your evidence, then the opposite lawyer has a duty to his client. Opposite lawyer has a duty to the court. And if he is not present when the evidence is recorded, it will be a failure of his duty. I would call it a professional misconduct. Why? If in his absence, the party gets a document which is not duly stamped, mark, judge also doesn't apply his mind and mark the document, then you cannot come afterwards and object to the marking. If an objection regarding marking of a document is to be taken, especially with reference to stamp duty, that should be taken before the document is admitted. If an if a insufficiently stamped document is marked without objection, then neither the court nor the appellate court, the revisional court has a right to refuse to look into the document, though it is insufficiently stamped. So therefore, if a lawyer is not present in court, being in present he is not alert and object to the said document, he has not done this professional work. Now in this regard, please keep in mind the change in the law. Earlier, the law was If an objection is taken to the marking of a document, the court has to decide that objection then and there itself. It can't be postponed. Similarly, where any question is put to a witness is objected by the opposite part, that is oral evidence. And the other side objects to the even the question. The order 18, rule 11 says, the judge shall take down the question, the answer and the objection and the name of the person making it and that will be a part of the record and then he has to decide it. Similarly, Order 18, Rule 12 said, the court may record such remarks as it takes material respecting the demeanor of any witness while under examination. 
So this is broadly the law. This is all what you find in civil procedure. But the civil procedure court does not say when a document is sought to be objected to, the court shall decide then and there itself. But that was the practice. The result was the defendant objects, plaintiff argues his case, defendant argues his case, and the court is bound to pass an order. That order was challenged in revision. And if the High Court would entertain that revision and grant a stay, the entire proceeding got stayed. That was the reason for delay in disposal of civil cases earlier. Don't blame the CPC. There is, no, so there is nothing in CPC. The way we practice, the way we implemented the CPC. Therefore, in the year 2000, Supreme Court brought about a change and declared a law under Article 141 of the Constitution. What is that? They said, here afterwards, in all the courts, if a document is objected to at the time of marking, if the objection relates to stamp duty, if the objection relates to registration, then the court shall decide that objection then and there. In all cases of other objections, the court shall mark the document subject to objection and hear that objection at the time of final hearing. If the person objected is able to persuade the court not to look into the document, don't look into the document. Without looking into the document, write a judgment. If he is not able to convince the court that his objection is sustainable, then look into the document and then purchase it. But that decision is postponed to at the time of final hearing. And therefore, there was no scope for anybody to challenge it. If you want to challenge it, challenge it in a, as a ground in an appeal. There is no challenge to an interlocutory order and stay of further proceedings. And then matter being in cold storage in the trial court. Having said that, they said as far as stamp duty and registration is concerned, that cannot be postponed. That has to be decided. Now, what are the provisions which deals with marking of a document? So, the marking of a document is a very important stage in a trial court and an important aspect of trial court because advocates should ensure inadmissible evidence should not be brought on record and so that the trial is not initiated. In this regard, Order 13, Rule T, speaks about rejection of irrelevant or inadmissible documents. Irrelevant or inadmissible documents. What does it say? The court may, at any stage of the suit, reject any document which it considers irrelevant or otherwise inadmissible recording the grounds for such rejection. So the court has been given the power to decide whether a document is irrelevant or otherwise inadmissible and if it comes to the conclusion, reject it by giving sufficient reasons. If it is not rejected, if it is not rejected, then what the court is expected to do? That is provided in Order 13, Rule 4. Unfortunately, these provisions are not looked into by the lawyers and the judges. There is everything is in black and white. Or the 13 rule 4 says, endorsements on documents admitted in evidence. This endorsement is made without applying mind mechanically. Whereas the statutory provision says it's a mandatory requirement to be followed by a judge. So what is that a judge is expected to do when he admits a document? How is a document admitted? Subject to the provisions of the next following sub-rule, 
there shall be endorsed an every document which has been admitted in evidence in the suit the following particulars namely the number and title of the suit the name of the person producing the document the date on which it was produced and a statement of its having been so admitted and the endorsement shall be signed or initiated by the judge a lawyer will never know this he is only worried about exhibit p1 p2 that is only marking it is a ministerial act that is done by your court officer the law doesn't say anything about that on the contrary law says about admission of a law that exhibit number is given only for the purpose of identification when you want to argue you can't go on referring to the document exhibit p1 is the same date exhibit p2 is the receipt exhibit p3 is something else so you need not it's only identification but what is important is admission the reason why lawyer doesn't know this is in every court there is a seal with all these particulars after the document is marked as exhibit p1 it is the job of the court officer to put the seal and fill up all these particulars and then in the end of the day he has to place it before the judge for his signature that is the endorsement the law expects when the judge puts his seal puts his chota signature on that the document is said to have been admitted the question is this admission of document and the judge putting his signature is it a administrative act or a judicial act it is an administrative act that is delegated to the section office or the court officer or the bench clerk we call it the trial court he does it then you call it as a cannot call it as admission he has no power to admit the power to admit rests with the judge this power to admit is a judicial function he must apply his mind therefore there should be a conscious application of mind by the judge before admitting the document in evidence once he applies his mind and admit the document in evidence that the end of it no question of recalling a this admission of other documents subject to objection yes you can argue it out afterwards but if it is a case of stamp duty especially stamp duty the judge has to apply his mind if objected to then decide whether the stamp document is duly stamped or not if a document is not duly stamped the stamp act expects him to perform his statutory function in a particular manner it is not cpc the moment the document is not duly stamped it falls within the purview of the stamp act and an obligation is cast on the judge how to deal with this insufficiently stamped documents therefore this admission of a document as contemplated in the civil procedure code is a judicial act an act to be performed by the judicial officer and after applying his mind they said he has to apply his mind consciously to the question whether the document was admissible or not and then admit the document therefore though the rubber stamp is put by the bench clerk the judge puts the initial no other person can put the initial the initial has to be put by the judge and because of the judicial function once that is done the document is admitted out of 13 rule 8 also refers to insufficiently stamped documents before we go to the stamp act see what the cpc says court may order any document to be impounded not withstanding anything contained in rule 5 or rule 7 of this order or in rule 17 of order 17 or 7 the court may if it thinks see sufficient cause direct any document or book produced before it in any suit to be impounded and kept in the custody of the office of the court for such period and subject to such conditions as the court may think fit so the power to impound a document which is 
rendered in evidence produced before the court civil court lies with the judge that power is conferred under order 13 rule 8 of the civil procedure code now that is about important now the most important thing is this objection regarding stamp that's a in every case you will have this problem revisions uh, applications for sending it to the registrar and all now let us look at it in a analytical manner i have told you what are the provisions of the civil procedure code and then what are the provisions of the stamp act which a civil court has to keep in mind and enforce it in its court when it admits a document in evidence the reason why stamp duty is taken out by the supreme court and said it should be decided then and there itself was the stamp act is a fiscal measure to secure revenue for the state on certain classes of instruments in fact it is one of the major sources of revenue to the amount uh, to the state and it is a perennial source every year you get a particular amount more transactions more money and that is one of the perennial substantial source of money for the government to meet its commitments it is not enacted to arm a litigant with a weapon of technicality to meet the case of his opponent sometimes there is the impression both the judge and the public will have why are you objecting to it they say well, what is the benefit you are going to get and by such an objection you are preventing a document being produced into court it is too technical it is not technical it is not technical. the stringent provisions of the act are conceived in the interest of the revenue once the object is secured according to law the party seeking his claim on the instrument will not be defeated on the ground of initial defect in the instrument the just salary has to come from this revenue he can go on admitting documents which are insufficient to stamp therefore it is not a question of being broad hearted now earlier she was announcing a judge should have uh, uh, what is that soft mind just should be considerate judge should be considerate where human aspects are involved where uh, justice is to be done these are all fiscal legislations fiscal legislations if they are implemented there is no court how do you run the court by big heart you can't run the courts you have to pay the salary of the staff you have to pay the salary of so many people and that's why the parliament has made this enactment state legislatures have made enactment these fiscal legislations cannot be just ignored and by showing your broader heart now this act karnataka stamp act 1957 has few definitions which a lawyer and a judge must know when they are objecting to it and why they are objecting to it when you say the document is not duly stamped it means it is not it is a chargeable to duty and not duty what do you mean by chargeable that is defined chargeable means as applied to an instrument executed or first executed after the commencement of this act chargeable under this act and is applied to any other document chargeable under the law in force in the territories of the state of karnataka when such instrument was executed or where several persons executed the instrument at different times first executed you know as far as taxation is concerned that is the prerogative of the state and stamp act says what document is chargeable with what duty this is an enactment passed by the legislature only if the government had no authority to pass the legislation it would be done merely on the ground what is charged is more we can never set aside a fiscal legislation so the karnataka stamp defines so many instruments in the schedule it also provides what is the stamp duty payable on those instruments it is clearly defined chargeable to duty once it says what is chargeable to duty and if it is charged then it becomes duly stamped so therefore the word duly stamped is also defined duly stamped is applied to an instrument means that the instrument bears impressed stamp of not less than the proper amount 
and that such time will be impressed in accordance with law for the time being in force in the territories of the state of Karnataka. Whatever is chargeable, mentioned in the document, if it is paid, then the do document is duly stamped. And what is to be stamped? Instrument. The word instrument is also defined. Instrument includes every document and record created or maintained in or by electronic storage and retrieval device or media by which any register liability is or purpose to be created, transferred, limited, extended, extinguished or recorded. So, instrument includes all these things. Having defined this, now that, that, that enactment casts an obligation on the court and other authorities. What is the obligation? 33 of the Stamp Act speaks about examination and impounding of it. We are examining a witness in court. Through the witness, a document is sought to be produced. And now the judge who is receiving that document for being admitted, under Section 33, is expected to examine, find out is it duly stamped. If it is not stamped, impound the instrument. This is what he is expected to do. 33 says, every person having by law or consent of parties authority to receive evidence and every person in charge of a public office except an officer of the police. No police, police officer is not given the authority. Every person in charge of a public office except an officer of the police before whom any instrument chargeable in his opinion, with duty is produced or comes in the performance of his function, shall, the word used is shall. If it appears to him that the instrument is not duly stamped, impound the same. Take it out. Take to your hand. Impound. For that purpose, every such person shall examine every instrument so chargeable and so produced or coming before him in order to ascertain whether it is stamped with a stamp of the value and description required by law in force in the state of Karnataka when the instrument was executed or first executed. The way this section is worded, a judge should not wait for an objection being taken by a lawyer, opposite lawyer. A statutory duty is cast on a judge when he is receiving evidence to be alert, take the evidence to his hand, find out is it a document which requires to be stamped, and if it is so, whether it has been duly stamped, and if it is not duly stamped, import the document. How does the witness is recorded in the court? The judge will be looking and looking at somewhere else. The lawyer will take out the, all the documents. They go on dictating, exhibit P1, so on, so on, exhibit P2. They will not say what is the document of. Exhibit P1 to T13, mark. Three documents request stamp duty. It is also marked. Neither, I understand the plaintiff's law. He is trying to manipulate and push a document which is not duly stamped. According to him, that is intelligence. If he is an officer of the court, a friend of the court, he also has a duty. The law provides if a document is not duly stamped. He must know it is not in that visible. He can go to the district registry, get it duly stamped and produce it. He can advise the client. It will not be done because it is not the job of the lawyer. And so the judge is concerned, he will be sitting there recording. He will say something that well, the person, he has no patience to look into the court. Other side lawyer is not present because the exam is involved and was examined afterwards. This is so important. If you want. Respect, respectability. Everyone should do their job. If a lawyer is present, that's why I said, forget about all those things. You have to protect your interest of your client. If you object, say, look, that is a document which requires to be stamped, not to be stamped, then the judge will open his eyes. And he cannot postpone the decision to a later date. He must consider that objection then and there and pass an order. And if it is not duly stamped, impound the document. You examine it. Look into the stamp act. Find out what is the nature of the document. Find out what is the duty prescribed under the law. And then if it is not paid, 
take it to your hands. Now, as I said, section 33 speaks about two things. One, examination of instruments and importing of instrument. It has to be done by the court whether there is an assistance to him from the members of the bar. Now, once a document is impounded, it is not the court. That is why you produced it. Question is, a document impounded can be looked into and acted upon. Section 34 clearly makes the position clear. Instruments not duly stand, inadmissible in evidence. That's where the, you are producing the document to support your case. The document is not duly stand. And if such a document is produced into court, and if it is objected to at the stage of marking, what happens? The document is imported. What is the value of that imported document? Nothing. No instrument chargeable with duty shall be admitted in evidence for any purpose by any person having by law or consent of parties authority to receive evidence or shall be acted upon, registered or authenticated by any such person or by any public officer unless a such instrument is duly stand. So, impounding of a document is not admission of a document. Only when the document is admitted in evidence by judge putting his signature on the document at the place earmarked for him, the document is admitted in evidence, the judge can look into that. But if it is impounded on the ground, it is insufficiently stamped duty. It can't be looked into. It is inadmissible in evidence. The very purpose of producing the document is gone. So the court has to decide the case without the document. If the entire case is based on the document or the document is not looked into, plaintiff is out of court. So that's why this objection assumes importance. And once the document is admitted without objection, it is not open to anybody to say, no, 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 I'll file application, recall the order, all that is gone. Then the law says, cast one more obligation on the judge. That is, if you impound a document, what is that is immediately expected to do? Any such instrument not being an instrument chargeable with a duty not exceeding 15 naya paisa only, or a mortgage of crop chargeable under clauses A and B of section 3 with a duty of 25 naya paisa shall, subject to all just exceptions, be admitted in evidence on payment of the duty with which the same is chargeable, or in the case of an instrument insufficiently stamped, or on the amount required to make up the duty, together with a penalty of 5 rupees, or when 10 times the amount of the proper duty or deficient portion thereof exceeds 5 rupees of a sum equal to 10 times a duty or a portion. So therefore, when a document is impounded, it is not the end of the day. If the party who is producing the document, which is impounded, is willing to pay the stamp duty payable or the deficient stamp duty which requires to be paid, plus 10 times that value, it's called duty and penalty. Then it becomes duly stamped and becomes invisible in evidence. Now, there was a lot of controversy. The word used is 5 rupees. 5 rupees is in the other case, when it is 15 paisa, 25 paisa, 5 rupees. If it is more than that, 10 times. One of the broad-hearted judges of our court said, all right, I will impose 5 rupees. Then the question was, does the civil court have the jurisdiction to impose that penalty of 5 rupees? Answer is no. That 5 rupees is only for if this duty payable is 5 rupees or 10 rupees. 5 paisa or 15 paisa, 15 paisa or 25 paisa. If it is more than that, he has no discretion except to impose 10 times. After imposing it, it will be sent to the deputy uh, district registrar. There you go and plead and get back the money. No problem. He has the power to reduce the stamp duty. But the civil court has no duty because Civil court is deciding a civil dispute. They cannot want to into revenue matters. 
Therefore, they said, straight away you impose duty and 10 times penalty. Collect the penalty, admit the document, look into the evidence, and go on with the case and send that copy to the district registry. Who will, after hearing the parties, may in his discretion reduce the stamp duty? Therefore, this is a very important part of a judicial function when examination in chief is done in court. All this comes when you are doing the examination in chief. Then section 35 says that is where the lawyer should be careful. Where an instrument has been admitted in evidence, such admission shall not except the provided in section 58 be called in question at any stage of the same suit or proceeding on the ground that the instrument has not been duly stamped. That is the damage happens to a case when the lawyer is not alert, he does not object to it, then his client's interest is bound to suffer. And you cannot make an application to recall the order. You cannot show sufficient cause for the non-appearance at the time the examination is done. All those will not be heard. And that is, from this is section, this section has been the subject matter of interpretation by the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court is categorical, uh, they have said, at any stage in the proceedings, nor in the appeal, nor in the revision, nor anywhere else, that order admitting the document cannot be restrained. So that is the position. Therefore, it is necessary for the lawyer, opposite lawyer, to be present when documentary evidence is adduced. He has a copy of the document. He can also look into the document. He can make a note which document requires stamp duty, which document requires registration, and other documents. In the case of other documents, you object, subject to objection, it is marked. What is that objection? You tell the judge at the time of a review. As far as in these two cases are concerned, objection should be right then and there, and it should be decided by the court, and the court should either admit the document, or if it is not duly stamped, import the document. Once it is imported, he has a freedom, liberty, option to pay the duty and ten times the penalty. And once that is done, the document is again marked and it is admissible and the court can look into the document and proceed with the matter. So therefore, though these sections are there, in every case we find this problem. We find this problem because Neither the judge nor the lawyer has applied their mind. In fact, today the practice is the senior will tell the junior, go and object everything. So that the junior will be objecting to everything. He will be objecting to a letter written by him to him also. See, this objection is not uh, a, a formality. You must know what you are objecting. Suppose oh, there is a document which is in your favor and you object to it, then what is that you are going to gain? So therefore, trial should be taken seriously. The rules of the game are clearly laid down. The object behind the rule is to be understood. And only when in one or two cases by your negligence a document is marked and something happens, then you will learn in life how costly it was on that day you are not present. In trial court what happens, you are waiting. Some case is going on. You just go to the canteen to have a cup of coffee. By the time you cup of coffee, he has put the witness in the box. What will you tell your senior? Then all sorts of explanations. See, see, this trial work is a very serious work. And if you can do the serious work for quite some time, then you will be a king. You will be a lord. Knowledge is power. From where do you get power? Not by your muscles going to the residing. This is the uh, trial work from 11 to 5 in court, whether it's your case or somebody's case, if you are present and see the drama, this is a drama in real life. You must be a hero in real life. We have heroes in, don't follow them. You are a hero, in, a lawyer is a hero in real life. And what happens between 11 to 5 in court is a real drama. And if you spend over 10 years in trial court, take it from me, you can conquer the world. You can conquer the world only if you are serious about that. Straight away you go to high court. In high court you won't get this drama. Only stay, sit down, get out. That's all. 
Is this here? You can do something. And you must have the CPC by your side. Arrows are there. You should know how to shoot the arrow at the opponent. Shoot the, shoot the arrow at the judge. And you must be confident of doing what you are doing. And all this should be done for the cause of justice, not for fun. Sometimes, of course, you will play to the gallery in the court. People will be sitting there. That's all there in human nature. And at that young age, that is all required. But the fact remains, this is a, touching a live current wire, a real life drama going on. And people have come to you thinking that you are a rendered man, you are going to protect their interests, you are going to effectively meet your opponent, however strong he may be, and you meet him with your knowledge. That's why I said knowledge is power. So because how to object, what to object, when to object, is something which you have to learn by sitting in the court, not by reading in the book, in the library. Now, when the exam chief is by way of an affidavit, Along with the affidavit you have produced documents, or already documents are produced, then you are marking the document. Sometimes they are found in the affidavit, in exam in chief itself, they mark the document. How can you mark the document? That thereby you are preventing the opposite from objecting to you. And a judge should be careful and say, I'll throw it out. Now you see the Commercial Courts Act. What are the powers conferred on the court? If you write some nonsense, if you're some frivolous, they say, throw away the affidavit or take the pen and strike out those paragraphs. That is not permissible in other cases, but that's how we are paying for. Therefore, when an examination in chief is done by an affidavit, it can be only by oral evidence. And if a document is concerned, the witness is put in the box and he, to him, a document is to be shown and then he will say what it is. Then the court should admit the document. It is at that stage, the other side will get an opportunity to object to this document. And therefore, if the court is admitting the document, not on the ground of stamp duty, you must say, so-and-so objects to it, or exhibit P1 is marked subject to objection. If it is stamp duty, then you must say it. There is no other course. And then and there, he must hear and decide the question. Therefore, when a document, most importantly, let me tell you, this is not there in the book. Along with the plan, you have produced the documents. That is, documents are produced into court. After before settlement of it, you are expected to produce the original documents into court. It is there. Are you under an obligation to tender all documents in evidence and get it marked? No. It so happens when you are ready to get it, you will see some documents are produced are against you. But it is already in court. Production is first stage. You are not expected to tender all documents produced before the court. Produ tender those documents which you want to rely on. What do you mean by tendering it? Giving it to the hands of the party, saying what is this document? If you don't show it to him, it will be in the file. Court can't look into it. Court will look into only those documents which are tendered in evidence. Production is different from tendering that evidence in court. Once the document is tendered in evidence, subject to objection, whatever it is, court has to apply consciously its mind, examine the document, and then admit it in evidence. As a proof of admission, it is given an exhibit mark, exhibit P1, exhibit P2, exhibit D1, D2. So therefore, production of a document, tendering the document in evidence, admitting the document in evidence, and then marking the document in evidence. Once the document is marked, does it mean it is proved? Proof is totally different from marking the document. That marking is for identification. These are the documents on which you rely on. If the other side admits the document, the court can look into it. If the other side is disputing the document, say for example, he says, I have not executed this document. It does not bear my signature. No such document in existence. It is a document created by you. It is marked. It is not proved. If it is a document executed by him and is denying the execution, a duty is cast on you to examine witnesses who will speak about the execution of the document by him. If you do not have witnesses, probably you have to send the document 
to a forensic expert for comparison of admitted signature the disputed signature after all this you may request the court to compare the admitted signature the disputed signature with the naked eye and request the court to come to its own conclusion so mere marking of a document is not proof of document for example a person says i got the property under the will the propounder propounder and nothing to do with the will except that he gets the property section 68 of the evidence act says if a document is to be attested compulsorily attested and attested especially in the case of will if the document is to be proved you must examine one attesting witness there is nothing like admission of a will only when a one attesting witness is examined in court the court on seeing his evidence can come to the conclusion whether the will is executed or not so mere marking but when the propounder pr produces the will but he produced it to court then he tendered it evidence then it is marked but he has to prove for proof he must examine and attest it so therefore when you are talking about documentary evidence you must also have a clear idea we are a dumping it to court is not production that is only producing it to court then you have to tender it then it has to be admitted and after that right, if that document is disputed you have to prove that document by such evidence which is permissible in law so then only you can say that document is admitted at that stage when objection is taken to mark stand to be and if it is impounded you have an option to pay the duty and penalty and get it mark and then the court will look into the document if you do not pay stand duty and penalty court will not look into the document court will not mark the document but without objection if it is marked then the court is bound to look into the document though it is not duly stamped and it may go affect the interest of the opposing party so this is what happens in a court so therefore in a trial especially when a party relies on documentary evidence marking of a document admission of a document proof of a document is very important and unless only you know the different shades of meaning of these words how it actually happens in court in real life and what is the law on the point then you can face a trial with full confidence i think time is up that's why i said i was, I was, I was very eager to tell you this because uh, today's generation may not have an opportunity to know all this it is not in the book uh, if you look into the judgment there are some conflicting judgments therefore i thought Uh, the bar council has given me an opportunity to say what i want to say as far well as trial and marking of the document is a very important facet of a civil court trial thank you let me have some questions i know there will be a lot of questions on this point thank you sir for illuminating us and sharing substantial inputs i now request mr madhusudana reddy advocate to take over the question and answer session over to you sir thank you varsha so thank you sir for sharing your profound knowledge i started to go to key, uh, question and answer sir question yes yes sir what is reexamination and the same is rejected can that can that right be agitated by revision or a writ reexamination is an attempt to clarify a doubt which is created in the cross examination the question put in the reexamination if it does not fall within the scope of reexamination the judge is fully justified in refusing to permit no revision no appeal lies against that order because it is not going to finally decide this case yes. sir preponderance of probabilities what is and how how much it is relevant to a criminal case sir yes. dealing with a civil procedure court Preponderance of probabilities is a concept which is well known in civil law, as opposed to beyond reasonable doubt in criminal law. In criminal law, because a person will go behind the bars or he may be hanged, the law says everything should be proved strictly and beyond reasonable doubt. In a civil matter, circumstantial evidence, documentary evidence, the experience of real life all counts. and it is not necessary to prove beyond reasonable doubt some scope is given to defense and then come to the conclusion whether a particular fact is proved or not because if a judge says it is proved it is proved if a judge says it is not proved not proved. so
So ultimately, what would a prudent man would say on the basis of the material? If it comes to the conclusion, yes, I am satisfied, it is proved, it is proved, and that is probability of the case. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, see, when a person who is in custody of original document does not produce, but produces certified copies, can the document be marked? The document to be produced by a party who relies on the primary evidence. If the document is in the possession of the opposite party, and if the opposite party refuses to produce that primary evidence, party can produce secondary evidence. But instead of original document, they produce certified copy. That is as good as a document, unless the execution is in dispute. If the execution is disputed by producing certified copy, you can't prove execution. But with the opposite party who is in possession of original says to take this uh, certified copy and execution is not in dispute, very well, you can act on the document. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, how to submit digital evidence like emails, WhatsApp, etc.? Is section 65B is mandatory or directory? I think the judgment of the Supreme Court, 65B as an affidavit is mandatory. And uh, I and you won't understand is digital. The present generation understands and they are better suited. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Sir, can a defendant lead evidence when a written statement not filed? No, he can't. Because evidence is led in support of the plea taken in the pleadings. When there is no written statement, on what basis is leading uh, evidence? Then principle of natural justice is requires opposite parties should have an idea. When you are not filed any pleadings, no question of leading evidence. So the same thing is applicable to consumer courts also. Yeah, all courts. So there's a fundamental principle of all governing all civil proceedings. Sir, how to submit evidence in voice in digital uh, digital form, particularly in a defamation case? Well, 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 uh, produce the cassette, yes, which contains the voice. In, in a defamation case? Yes, yes. Defamation yes. case is not the voice. It is what yes, voice has said is important. <laughs> yes, it may be a very sweet voice, but it has said horrible things. It is that which is defamatory. Now somebody may say that is not my voice. Oh, yeah, that, is that, my that, that, that requires uh, examination. There are technical aspects. Yes, sir. sir, whether marking of a document is sufficient and deemed to be admitted, and can the document uh, is taken to be proved as proved? That's what I told you. Marking of a document is a ministerial act. It is only admission of a document. If the document is in dispute, the person who is relying on the document has to produce evidence to prove the document. Mere production, marking, admission is not proof of the document. If the document is not in dispute, you produce it, mark it, that's the end of it. No question of proof. If the document is disputed, apart from doing all this, you must prove the document. Acceptable evidence. Thank you, sir. Sir, document is with def uh, defendant, not produced intentionally, and produced certified copy, of, let's say it's a will here, or certificate of a will. Is it necessary to produce original will? If the will is in dispute, will is to be proved. How will you prove a will? An attesting witness should come to the witness box and tell the court that he signed the document in the presence of the executant. If the original itself is not there, how will this evidence be produced? So the question is, the, the will is registered, but let's say there is my elder brother. Yes. Younger brother yes. I like then you, you must make out a case for secondary evidence. And then you can have to speak. Thank you, sir. Sir, in an admitted document, can that be imported later due to insufficiency of stamps? There are two aspects. Impounding a document at the time of admission. Impounding a document at the time of admission is permissible when the objection is taken. Assuming objection is not taken, document is impounded, uh, not impounded, marked. Court is bound to look into the document and decide the case. So, on the ground that it is insufficiently stamped, the court cannot refuse to look into the document subsequently. But Section 33 and 34 cast an obligation to the court. If an application is filed, you impound the document after it is, then send it to the sub office for him to collect the revenue. He will do his job. Thank you, sir. Okay, the same thing. The DVD, DVD is filed complying with 65B. 
in a defamation case but uh, presiding officer refuses and do not take cognizance what is the remedy available you will ask him to pass an order the judge is not a monarch he can't say i will not look into it if he says no final application pass an order challenge that order in the higher court thank you sir sir a defendant not file written statement can ia under order 8 rule 10 be filed and pray to post the matter for uh, argument slash judgment what is it i am not able to understand that question when you are not when you are not, filed a, when you are not filed a written statement yes sir you proceed to pass an order by looking into the pleadings and the evidence and give to the plaintiff that's all that's the question of defense Sir, what is the purpose of main purpose of order 8 rule 10 is the question sir, sir. that is what i said if there is no defense the court cannot simply say suit is decreed no no court has to apply its mind and it can call upon the plaintiff to produce evidence once he produces evidence the law says merely because written statement is not filed you cannot simply say relying on order 8 rule 5 that it is plaintiff allegations are admitted suit is decreed no in the plain in the judgment you must say what the case of the plaintiff is then you say defendant has not filed written statement and then you say this is the point that arises for consideration because there is no issue and then refer to the evidence documentary and oral evidence and then you have to pass an order merely because the defendant has not filed written statement there is no guarantee suit is to be decreed if the court is not satisfied can dismiss the suit thank you sir sir when there are several issues and some to be proved by the defendant what is the role of the plaintiff as regards to those issues that is proved by the defendant that's what he has got an option he can need evidence in respect of issues where the burden is on him he can also need evidence in respect of issues the burden of which is the defendant if he is so confident or he can say i have let evidence on the issues on which burden is on me i reserve my liberty i reserve my right to need rebuttal evidence after seeing the evidence of the defendant on those issues the burden is on him once that memo is filed liberty is reserved defendant enters the box adduces evidence on those issues then again you will get an opportunity to need evidence on those two issues taking into consideration the evidence already attached this is what is provided in order 8 18 rule 3 thank you sir sir um, see an interrogatory is posed uh, can the party and is not answered can the party uh, request for cross examination on that particular interrogatory why not why not sir cross of witness through video conference is it advisable can't it be can he be prompted only experience future experts should tell us how intelligent the witnesses are how intelligent the lawyers are how many they are going to cooperate to make an attempt to see what what happens there is no law precedent for this it is something future we have to wait and see we have to do and see how everybody reacts and assists what is your personal advice sir should you do should i have a witness be cross examined in the court or through vc what is this is a technological invention it is there is no pleasure I think I said you will be a hero in real life. It's a battlefield. All that pleasure you don't get it. This you will you will be seeing your photo only. You will not see others' photos. <laughs> sir, thank you, sir. Sir, can the cross examination of a witness in one case be adopted by filing the certified copy in another case? Strictly okay, speaking, it is, strictly speaking, it is not permissible. Normally, what they do is. same thing is typed in the other case also by the parties certified copy no they should also record the same evidence could be recorded only by changing the case number <laughs> yes sir thank you sir propounder of it i think is answered but anyway i'll ask this question sir propounder of document should give uh, should propounder of document should give evidence the effect of propounder not being examined will that uh, will will the document considered proved any citations please guide propounder has no say in the will at all it is only the evidence of the attesting witness which will prove the will understand 
Propounder is nowhere in the other picture. If he says, I was present at the time of bill, that will get vitiated. Yes, sir. Sir, GPA is executed, sir, but not notarized or registered, but marked in evidence, subject to objections. Is it an admissible document? That's what I said. Strictly speaking, power of attorneys does not require registration. Now, I think in our power of attorney executed to execute a sale deed, they have said it requires registration. Earlier, a power of attorney executed, permitting the person to present the document for registration was composite registration. See, the effect of registration is different from stamp duty. If a document is not registered and marked, it doesn't become admissible. Tomorrow I am going to deal with that uh, non-registration. Tomorrow that I will do. Thank you. Registration act, I will deal with that. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, documents marked, misplaced by court. What is the procedure? All right. We'll produce a copy which is with you. It's called, uh, they call it uh, rebuilding the office the papers. It happens. Sometimes it is lost. Whatever copies we have got, we produce it. Sir, documents produced but not marked. So the, I think the document produced by the plaintiff along with you, he said that it's not marked, sir. But can that document be asked in cross-examination? Why not? In the cross-examination, you can produce any document. You can take out a document from your pocket and give it to him. You are taking out the document from the court and show it to him. Sir, a defendant, who is, the document which is marked, which is produced by the plaintiff. All right, the document is in the court. Plaintiff yes, sir. has produced. He did not offer it for a document. It is available. He can take out and put it in the cross-examination. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, can a document be objected only during recording of evidence? It can't be done earlier, say in return statement? Please guide. Sometimes they do it. Sometimes they do it. But earlier doing it is of no use. You must be present when the document is admitted in evidence. Who will read it? At the time of evidence, nobody will read your return statement. <laughs> He is producing it. Somebody should be present and say, object to it. Our court also should look into it, object to it. At the time of Recording. admission, yes. before admission, that is the right time to object to the document. Objection appeared, document not marked, not admitted in evidence. Objection overruled, admitted in evidence. Objection not noticed, admitted in evidence. Oh, okay. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, uh, impounded documents, so how to get it back, sir? The document is impounded and I have not paid the penalty, that's all. You have impounded the document, the court will send that document to the registrar, uh, the district registrar. You go there, pay duty and uh, get it back. So I can't get it, take it back, it's impounded. Okay, it it the, uh, doc, uh, okay, once you. the document is impounded, allow the document to be impounded, then it is the property of the court. You lose control. If you don't tender it, yes, it is yours. Sir, last question, sir. Uh, one more is there. I'm oh, sorry. Okay, sir. Documents produced to refresh memory in cross examination, not duly stamped document. What is the position of law? Okay. It's only refreshing memory. It is not admitted in evidence. It cannot be marked as yes. in, in the cross examination. No, nobody, want, nobody wants it to be marked. You don't only to refresh the memory. All right, sir. Sir, another three more questions, sir. Can I go? Yes. On? In a financial institution, the manager takes signatures on promissory note by the debtor. Does the manager become propounder? Does the signature of a debtor is said to be attested? He is not a propounder means that is the word normally used to a will only. Property is given to him. If he is able to establish it, propound that will in court of law and prove it, he gets the property. Here it is a commercial transaction. He is the manager. Debtor goes there. He gives him the money, asks him to sign the promissory note. In his presence, it is, it is taken. That's all. Thank you, sir. The documents marked without examining the liability of payment of duty can be reopened subsequently or not? Section 35 of Karnataka Stamp Act, they're asking. That's what I said. Yes, sir. If it is marked, court is bound to look into it and pass a judgment on merits. If a request is made to impound the document and send it to the sub uh, to the district registry, that also can be done. There are two independent procedures. Thank you, sir. Sir, kindly enlighten us about the significance of the questions in cross-examination. Does the question amount to defense uh, aspect of the party? Cross-examination is in two portions. One, 
destroying the case of the plaintiff. Two, trying to get answers to prove your defense. Thank you, sir. One more question. Three more questions, sir. Can I go? Yes. Sir, what is the procedure? Stamp duty, uh, stamp duly, uh, stamp duty duly stamped. But instrument exists more than stamp. Procedure stamp duty duly stamps. Okay, it's a stamp duty paid on the document. That's what he means. That is, that is, court does not do the excess stamp duty. It's only going to be insufficient stamp duty. My question is this. So when the judge insisting interrogatory can advocate ask for cross examination normally in consumer forum they insist for interrogatory in medical negligence cases they ask. If it is in the forum, no law is applicable. You can everything is free. You can do whatever you want. I think sir, in one case there are three defendants. Defendant number one files written statement. Defendant number two and three will file memo admitting. Written statement filed by D1. Will the defendant two and three uh, will lose the right to cross examination? They adopt, I think. Once they adopt the written statement of first defendant, that written statement is the defense of all the three persons. A defendant can cross examine without filing defense. Here he has filed a defense and he can cross examine. Uh, thank you, sir. I think that's all for the day. If anything is there, I'll ask tomorrow, sir. Oh, uh, I just wanted to say that for many people, you are many things, sir. But for me, you are an inspiration, sir. And uh, I, I take this advocate is a hero in real life. Take your profession seriously. Attend courts. You learn more there, not in library, office, or in canteen. Thank you very much, sir. Over to our shop, please. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for sharing your critical reviews. I also extend my sincere thanks to Mr. Madhusudana Reddy. Henry Ford, an American industrialist and business magnate, says that Anyone who stops learning is old, whether this happens at 20 or at 80. Anyone who keeps on learning not only remains young, but becomes constantly more valuable regardless of physical capacity. With this thought, I on behalf of Karnataka State Park Council Law Academy extend my cordial gratitude to our esteemed dignitary Honorable Justice N. Kumar. Sir will be continuing with the same topic tomorrow and if time permits, he will also address on the topic judgments. I would also like to thank all the members of Karnataka State Bar Council, trustees of KSBC Law Academy, guests, advocates, and all the participants who are actively participating and extending your support. Kindly join us with the same meeting ID and password at 5.30 p.m. till 13th November 2020. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night.